All right, now that we um, talked about um, how you would be able to, um, or, or what you should be doing when you encounter a mathematical statement to um, um, prove, let's talk about the kinds of strategies that um, you may be able to pursue to be able to produce uh, proofs that are uh, beyond any doubt. And, uh, uh, and and completely logical. There may be different kinds of um, well, of course there are there are different kinds of mathematical statements um, that um, you encounter, and depending on the format of the statement and the kinds of things that it's trying to accomplish, um, there are different kinds of arguments that are used frequently. Um, here within this class, and, and in the majority of the computer science or the theory of computation um, that we encounter in mathematical statements, um, there are um, three types of um, arguments that we will use to um, prove um, 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 the, 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 the statements that we encounter. These three arguments, um, or there are three types of proofs that we um, try to work on, um, are uh, proof by um, construction, proof by contradiction, and proof by induction. If you've taken um, a discrete mathematics course um, in the past, you should have uh, experience with uh, these um, different categories of proofs. And, um, and and now I'm just going to go ahead and um, um, d describe these three uh, categories for you and try to find a couple of problems within each category um, to show you um, how, how it's done. And then I'll, I'll give you an assignment that uh, will have a bunch of different mathematical proofs that you will uh, work on um, and, and utilize these um, these concepts. So the first um, kind of proof that we generally might encounter um, in the theory of computation are problems that state that a particular kind of object exists, or that if the, or, or that a particular kind of object has a certain kind of property. One way to prove such theorems is by demonstrating how to construct the objects that the theorem talks about. And as you, you build these um, objects, you effectively demonstrate that the object exists, so therefore that statement must be true. Um, and these kinds of proofs, or this technique, is called proof by construction. Effectively, you produce the object that the, the, the theorem predicts its existence, its existence um, um, of and uh, and then effectively you basically uh, 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 what's the statement you you um, um, knock two birds with one stone um, you not only do you show the existence of such an object um, but also you you basically produce one along the way um, this will do a couple of times in the semester for example when we are um, uh, in, when we encounter the theorem about um, that non-deterministic or rather finite automaton except re regular languages, that's a statement. What we'll do is that we'll produce a finite automaton, we'll show that that actually the languages that are accepted by this finite automaton are regular. Um, and so, uh, so, so that's, that's the kind. Now, an example of such statements is, for example, what you see here. Um, if this um, looks um, weird to you, go back and Rewatch the first um, lecture, the first unit. There, we talked about quantifiers and different ways of writing mathematical notations. This statement reads, for every n greater than 2, n is a number, there exists a three regular graph G with exactly n nodes. A um, k regular graph is basically a graph in which, in which every node has k elements. So a, a three regular graph is a graph, so this graph G is a graph in which every node um, has D 
degree 3. This is what we call a k-regular graph. So what this statement is says that if you have a graph that is made of n nodes, if n is greater than 2, like for example 3, if you have 3 nodes, then you could create um, a 3 um, regular um, graph with it, um, meaning that um, for, for example, let's actually do a 4, it's, it's easier to see, um, that every single node in this graph will have degree 3. So one edge here, one edge here, one edge here, so this is degree equal 3. For this node, you've got one edge there, one edge there, one edge there, so this degree is equal to 3. The middle, there's one edge here, one edge here, one edge here. So the degree for this node is also 3. And then for this node up here, you've got 3 edges. So the degree for this node is also 3. Is 3. So um, the idea here is that you would assume that you have a, a number n from the natural numbers and that this number is greater than 2 then what you will do is that you will construct or, or to prove this statement you will have to construct a graph G um, graph G um, which is effectively a set of vertices and edges the length of vertices set so this is if you remember this is the set of your vertices or set of nodes. So the length is n, meaning that you have n nodes in here. Um, and, uh, um, and all we need to do is to construct the, um, the edges, um, the set of edges. And remember, edges is each element in the edge is a pair. The first one is one node, the second one is another node that are connected to each other. So let's suppose that V set of edges is a list of numbers 1, 0, 1, 2 to n minus 1 okay so if this is your 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 edges then let's say for four elements we'll have 0, 1, 2 and 3 okay so the, these these are effectively um, the set of edges. Then the way that we will construct this graph is a, a the, the graph's a set of edges is going to be another set, and this is going to be composed each each element of this set E, which is the edges. So the, the E is the set of edges in G. It's going to be a pair of I and J, I and, um, I and J, or rather I and I plus 1, um, I and I plus 1, um, in the graph. So a pair 0, 1, a pair 1, 2, a pair 2, 3, a pair 3, 0, okay? um, such that um, so, so for, for, for this is going to be for any i that is between 0 and n minus 2. So this is one set of edges. So, um, so in, in our case, let's say that n was 4. So our i is going to be 0, 1, 2, and 3. So if we connect 0 to 1, 1 to 2, and 2 to 3, this is going to give me this set. Okay. Um, union with the set um, I and I plus N over two where um, 
i is between 0 and n over 2 minus 1 and union with so I'm unioning those two sets and union with the set n minus 1 comma 0 so so this last item is this graph the first set is this set and the second set is going to be this line and this line so um, let me actually give them different colors so the first set the set of i and i plus ones this guys the set of i and i plus one is going to be this edge this edge and this edge then the set n minus 1 and 0 is going to be this edge. So this edge is going to be this set. And the set i comma i over n plus 2 is going to be this line and this line. This is going to be the green set here. So by constructing this set, you will notice that every node will have three um, degree three. Why? Because the set i is going to appear three times in these sets, and say i, I plus one, and so on and so forth. So every single i that you see in this in this union of these three sets that construct your edge, your your graph is going to basically appear three times, which means that each node will have the degree three, and you can you can extend this for any number of ends. So so one way to prove, as I just showed here is proof by construction. To prove that the statement is true, meaning that for every n greater than 2, a, that you can find a graph g um, that is 3 regular, that has n number of nodes, is to construct one such graph. And here's what we constructed the graph. We said that let's, let's suppose that its edges is a list of, is a set of 0 to n minus 1, uh, is, is nodes then the set of its edges will be from this form. And this form will ensure that that graph is 3 regular. So now that we have created that graph, we proved our theorem. So that's, that's one kind of theorem that we encounter. And the way that to prove this um, is uh, proof by construction. Again, if a statement postulates that such if there is an, uh, an, 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 a, an, an instance of an object, with these properties. To prove that is to make that object, and then you prove your point. We encounter another kind of proof in um, in mathematical statements in computer uh, science, um, in theoretical computer science, is when we encounter a statement um, um, that, that talks about a property of a certain kind of object. Um, one way to prove this is to assume it's called proof by contradiction, and to us to prove this is you assume that the statement is wrong, the theorem is wrong, and then from that assumption you build your path, your way to show that there is a contradiction. Um, for example, something like for example, if the theorem states that such and such object exists, then you assume that, to the contrary, that this object doesn't exist, or this property doesn't exist, or this property doesn't hold, then you start using mathematical statements, or rational mathematical statements, logical statements, to go step by step by step to show a contradiction, like 1 equals 3. Um, and obviously, 1 cannot be equal to 3, therefore, the statement must be true. Because if the statement were false, um, it would be a contradiction. Uh, we use this kind of proof in, 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 in daily lives a lot. Uh, for example, um, when you, when you um, come to the class or you enter a room and, um, 
and then you see that um, um, that that everybody in in the room is um, dry, and they just arrived um, into the room uh, a few minutes before you did. Then you would um, you would you would have a statement that it's not raining outside, right? And you prove that by contradiction. You say, well, let's suppose that uh, um, it was raining. Then if it was raining, then all these people must be wet. Now there's a contradiction. These people are not wet. Therefore, there shouldn't be raining outside. So, so, so this is the kind of proof that we kind of unconsciously do a lot in life, um, and and a mathematical formulation for this basic we call uh, proof by contradiction. Okay, so your textbook has a really nice example of. Um, a mathematical statement to prove by contradiction, and it's um, it's very simple. Um, the statement says that square root of two is not rational. Okay. Um, so before before I get to to do this proof, let me just um, um, talk to you on, about a couple of things uh, before we get in here. One is the definition of a rational number. We say that a number r is rational um, if we could um, write it in the form of r to be equal to m over n, where both n and m, m and n are integers. For example, number three fourth is a rational number. You can you can write it into in the form of two integers divided by each other. It's basically, or effective, is the ratio of two integers, whereas pi is not a rational number um, because it's um, basically 3.1415 and so forth. Um, so, um, and there aren't any integer numbers m and n such that you could write um, pi in the form of the divisions of two integers. So we want to prove that square root of 2 is not a rational number. Now to prove that is what we're going to do is that we suppose, we assume that it actually is a rational number. So we assume to the contrary. And then, um, and then mathematically we show that if that were to be the case, if, uh, if square root of 2 was, was indeed a rational number, then it would be a contradiction. Um, and since we can't have contradiction in mathematics, um, then the statement must be true. Then this, the um, the um, the square root of two is not rational. So so to prove um, to prove this, here's what we're going to do. So to prove that square root of two is not rational, what we are going to do is um, is we're going to assume that square root of 2 is rational. And then we show a, we show a contradiction. And then when we see a contradiction, then we will realize that then that statement was not true. So the square root of 2 could not be rational. So to do this, first, we say assume square root of 2 is rational. Then according to this fact, then air, then all, then um, square root of 2, just be a little bit neater here, so as to not get ourselves really too messy. So we assume that square root of 2 is rational. Therefore, square root of 2 can be written in the form of m over n, where both m and n are integer numbers. OK? So, so that's one thing. Now, let's, um, now if, um, M and N have a common divisor.
um, other than one. Then divide both by their common divisors. Right? We can't do that, and it wouldn't change a thing. So, for example, if m was, I don't know, like 9, and n was um, 6, then both of these are divisible by 3. So we would cut both by 3, then we would get a 3 and a 2. Right? So, so this, this statement here, this star statement here that I'm writing, is basically to make our lives easier. I'm going to say that, let's assume that square root of 2 is the, is, is, is a, the ratio of two integer numbers m and n. And then I say that go ahead and look at both m and n and if they have a common divisor then just divide it. Divide both of them by the common divisor that wouldn't change the, the anything here. Now when I do this after after I do this so after I get rid of um, both m and n's common divisor, then um, at least one will be odd. Okay. So let's actually think of this as Statement one. We'll get back to, to this a little bit later. So now we have this fact that square root of two is equal to m over n. Then we multiply two sides by n. So we'll do n square root of two is equal to m. Then we raise both sides by power of two. So we do square root n squared equals m squared. Then when you do this, now let's take this squared, so we get 2n squared equals m squared. Now, one funny thing is emerging here. See here, I then end up in a situation that, therefore, m squared is even. So m squared belongs to the even numbers. So since m squared is even, from this fact, I, um, um, uh, I I basically conclude that m is even, right? So I know that if you have an, a, a a square number that's an even, then um, its its square root must be even. See, for example, four square root of two uh, is is the square of two. Uh, Sixteen is the square root of four. Um, and so forth. So, um, so since m squared is even, then m must be even, right? So now here I know that then m is even. Then I can write m into a form of two times, let's say, k, right? So, so then uh, what I have here is that m must be equal to some two k. Um, because all the even numbers can be written into a form 2 times k, k being an integer. If I raise this to, to the power 2, both sides, then m squared is 4k squared, right? So now, look here, I have m squared is equal to 2n squared, and then I have m squared is equal to 4k. Now, if I put these, these two together, right here and right there, from these two, I conclude that 2n squared is equal to m squared, which is equal to 4k squared. From this fact, I'm going to get to the fact that 2n squared then is equal to 4k squared. Therefore, you divide this by 2, n squared is equal to 2k squared, which basically result in n squared being even. 
since n squared is even, then n must be even. Right? So I've got two problems, then I, I've got contradiction. I know that from this fact that um, square root of 2, I wrote it into the form of m and n. I notice that m is even and n is even, which contradicts with statement number one here. So I cannot have this fact happen. This would be a contradiction. And this contradiction is what I uh, get if, if square root of 2 were rational. So what this means is that if square root of 2 is rational, meaning that square root of 2 can be written into m over n, then it is contradiction. Because at least one of m or n must be odd but both are even which is a contradiction and therefore square root of 2 square root of 2 cannot be rational which means that square root of 2 is irrational end of proof so and, and so basically this is proof by contradiction you have a statement to prove you assume that the statement is wrong then logically you conclude a contradiction and since you can't have contradiction meaning that in our case m and m cannot both be even therefore there must be something wrong with the assumption that we made that square root of 2 was um rational so square root of 2 cannot be rational so this is um proof by contradiction All right, so um, we, we did um, prove that um, that square root of 2 is irrational by contradiction. So we move on to the next kind of um, argument that we use um, to prove uh, mathematical theorems in the theory of computation, and that's proof by induction. Proof by induction is an advanced method that is used to show that all elements of an infinite set have a special property. For example, oh, I don't know, um, like the sum of all elements from 1 to n um, of natural numbers is n times n plus 1 over 2. In fact, I'm going to show this, um, prove this to you by induction. Or um, that um, if, if you have a set um, um, that has n element, then its power set uh, has two to the n elements. So we're going to. I'm, I'm going to prove these two to you, uh, including the um, um, a, a, a another proof, another theorem uh, about uh, compound interest um, in, in a hypothetical um, loan payment scenario um, that the Seipser book um, has, which is kind of interesting, um, and we'll do these by induction. Um, to uh, do a proof by induction, effectively, we need to take two steps. Um, the, 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 the first step is, the, is called the basis step, and the second step is called the induction step. In the basis step, 
since if you if you if you remember when I talk about uh, what profile induction actually uh, entails, it, it entails about um, proving a statement about property of an infinite set, members of an infinite set. The problem with the members of an infinite set is that we cannot logically enumerate the property for every single one of them. So, for example, um, if a set has n elements, then its power set has two to the n elements, right? If I were to prove this by enumeration, I would have to prove this for an infinite number of sets, which is impossible to do because I would have to show that a set with one element has two, uh, its power set has two members. For two elements, its power set has four members. For three elements, its power set has eight members. For a set with 1,000 elements, its power set will have two to the thousand elements in it until the infinity, which cannot be done. Proof by induction comes in, in, in handy. Uh, for, for this particular case, um, that um, I could use um, this this two-phase proof in the basis step, which which uh, proves the case for the smallest member of the set we're talking about, um, which is called the basis case. I show that that property holds true for the base case. For example, for um, if I wanted to show, and I will. Um, that a power set of a set with n elements has 2 to the n elements, I show that a power set of a set with one element will have two elements in it. So that's my base case scenario. Then in the, in the inductive step, or in, in the induction step, what I will use is called an induction hypothesis. What I will do is that I assume that this statement is true for some number k, or n equal k, right? Then, I prove that that statement is true for k plus 1, or for k plus some number to it. And when I do this, this induction, um, induction step um, proves the statement for me, because then I could say it is true for every element. I show for k is true. I show if, it was, if, you, if for k it was true, then for k plus 1 is true. And then it follows logically, then it must be true for k plus 2, for k plus 3, for k plus 4, for k plus n, for everything that comes after it. So, so this is how, how proof by induction works. Um, again, two phases, two steps to do. First phase, basis step. You must show that the statement is true for the base case. If you skip that, that's gonna, that, that's, that, that is not going to be um, a complete proof. And then when you show it for the base case, then you will go ahead and show it for the induction step. What will you will do in the induction step is that, so basically we call this first step the base case or basis, and then this is going to be called the induction step. So what you'll, you'll have to do is you show it for the base case to be true, then you go and assume that it's true for n, then you show it's true for n plus 1, or you show it's true for k, and prove that it's true for the next k in line. And that will be um, proof by induction. So, um, as, as I promised, I'm going to do the, uh, the pro uh, proof um, for, for three different, different um, uh, statements. Um, and... Um, uh, the, the, one of one of the my, my favorite um, proof by inductions, and and a lot of times in series actually we encounter proof by inductions because we want to show the sum of a series or the product of a series or something like that that is infinite um, that we can't do. So what what we we'll do is that we show the base case, we show in the inductive step that it was tr true for n, it's true for n plus one, therefore it must be true for everything else. So um, so one of the the, the nicest uh, examples is is this. Uh, this sum of series. If you have um, um, a series that is um, made of numbers 1, 2, 3, and n, what I want to show is that the sum of n, let's call it s of n, to be the sum of these elements, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way to n. And I denote this with a symbol sigma i 1 to n i. And this summation is equal to 1 over 2 times n times n plus 1. 
or or you can also write it like this n times n plus one over two. Okay. So so this is the statement that I want to show. I want to say I want to show that if I have n elements from consecutive elements from natural numbers that start from one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way to the n, the sum of these numbers is going to be n times n plus 1 over 2. It's actually a very famous kind of um, um, uh, trivia, math trivia, that says that um, Gauss, the very famous um, uh, mathematician, German mathematician, actually did this solution when he was in, in school, elementary school. Um, he was in, in not really, really a, a, a quiet student, and so um, uh, and, and so is true for the class. So the teacher wanted to kind of hush them down. So um, he said, "Well, let's suppose that you have numbers one to I don't know one hundred, and what is the sum of the the sum of these numbers? What you get up, what you end up if you add all these numbers together?" And goes in a few minutes just uh, gives the answer, which was not possible by just enumerating and counting. Um, and so he basically says that, well, what we're going to do is that we're going to take half of the numbers and we go from one to half of the numbers and then we put the other half in a backwards order. All of them should um, should add up to n plus one and since we have half, then it's going to be half of uh, n plus one times n and that's the solution. So that is a quite a, quite a, a, a smart solution. Uh, or, or proof by construction, um, but what we're going to do, since we are not as smart as Gauss is, we are going to prove this by induction. So the idea here, the proof here, is proof by induction. So as I said, proof by induction requires two steps. The basis step, and then the induction step. So let's first do the basis step, if I can spell step. <laughs> so in the basis step, I want to I want to establish that this statement is true for the very base case. Set with one number number one okay so if my set is the set one then the sum of i equal one to one right i call this s of one okay now the basis step should say that s of one should be one over two times one times one plus one which is 1 over 2 times 1 times 2, which is 1. So this says that sum of set that's made of only number 1 is equal to 1, which is true. So the basis step holds. Okay, I'm done with halfway, actually, of my, my proof. Now is the inductive step. Now in the inductive step, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to assume that the theorem is true for n and then what I'm going to do is prove it true for n plus 1 Right. If I'm successful in establishing this, then I could indu I could use this hypothesis step or inductive step. Um, I, I I could invoke it infinite times. So because if if it was true for n, if I can show it's true for n plus one, then it's true for n plus one according to the same step. Then it must be true for n plus two. Then it must be true for n plus three, n plus four, n plus five, n plus six n plus infinity so it must be true right so this you can you can think of it as a, as a recursive kind of thing um or an iterative kind of thing if you show it that is true for two consecutive elements of your set then it will be true for the rest of them right so this is what our job is so in the induction induction step the step two dash one 
is the hypothesis. Hypothesis is that it's true for n. What does that mean? That means that s of n is equal to 1 over 2 times n times n minus n plus 1. Okay? So hypo in, in the, the, hypo the induction hypothesis states that let's assume that it's true for, for, for s of n. What we want to do is to show that is it true for s of n plus 1? Meaning that is s of n plus 1 equal to 1 over 2 times n plus 1 times n plus 2? See what I did here? I just replaced s of n plus 1 instead of n. So it goes n plus 1 goes here. So it's 1 over 2 n plus 1 times n plus 1 plus 1, which is n plus 2. Is it true? I don't know. This is my job. My job is to show that it is, in fact, true. So let's go ahead and show it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start writing S of n plus 1. So S of n plus 1 is the sum of all numbers from 1 to n plus 1, right? Which, if you look at this, it's going to be the sum of all numbers from 1 to n plus n plus 1, right? If you list all numbers 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus all the way to plus n plus 1, if you keep the first n of them, then you get 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 to n plus n plus 1. Right? Now, it's really funny. Look at this. Look at this. Isn't this already the sum of 1 to n i, isn't it? S of n, right? So, from this, I know that this then is S of n, right? So, therefore, S of n plus 1 is effectively nothing more than S of n plus n plus 1. Now, according to, the, my, to my induction hypothesis, right, I know that S of n, n is 1 over 2 times n times n plus 1. That's what I assume. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to just substitute this. So therefore, S of n plus 1 is equal to 1 over 2 times n times n plus 1 plus n plus 1. I didn't really do anything really super crazy. What I, all I did is I kept this n plus 1 here, right? And then I just substituted this s of n with whatever I assumed in my hypothesis case in my induction hypothesis, that s of n, I assume that it is already at 1 over 2 times n times n, times n plus 1, right? So, I just write this one. So, from here, notice what happened. s of n plus 1 is equal to 1 over 2 times n times n plus 1 plus n plus 1. Now let's do this. Let, let's look at this n plus 1 over here and this n plus 1 over here and factor these out. Okay, so then this will be 1 over 2 times n plus 1 times n plus 1. All I did, I didn't really do something crazy. I just factored this n plus 1 out and this n plus 1 out. So effectively, then this will become n plus 1 times 1 over 2. See the first half of this statement. And then if I factor this n plus 1 out, then 1 is going to be left out here. 
Now, let's reformulate this. This is going to be n over 2 plus I'm doing the common denominator 2 over 2 times n plus 1, right? Which is going to be n plus 2 over 2 times n plus 1. And refactoring these guys will give me 1 over 2 times n plus 1 times n plus 2. Okay? So, see, I started from s of n plus 1, and I ended up proving that it is actually, in fact, equal to 1 over 2 times n plus 1 times n plus 2, which was my Um, my induction step, which th here now I proved that this actually is fact, is true, right? So what I did is that then to recap for basis, um, I showed that S of 1 is equal to 1, and then for induction step, I showed that if it was true that s of n was n times n plus 1 over 2, then s of n plus 1 will be n plus 1 times n plus 2 over 2. And these together um, prove my hypothesis and my theorem, and therefore end of proof. So that's, that's one example of proof by induction over a series.